If we were to lay out all the drugs that release dopamine, we might arrange them the way chemists arrange atoms into the periodic table of the elements by their class, structure, and properties, except we will call our arrangement the periodic table of the intoxicants. We would have the usual drugs like alcohol and marijuana, cocaine and nicotine, but we would also find classes such as the stimulants, which contain crystal methamphetamine, or the intactogens, which are drugs that induce feelings of interpersonal closeness, such as ecstasy. We would also find the entheogens, drugs that create experiences of mystical significance. These used to be called the hallucinogens. They differ from the dissociants, drugs such as PCP and ketamine. Here's a big class, the sedative hypnotics. These are drugs that decrease anxiety and promote sleep. This would include drugs such as the barbiturates and the benzodiazepines like Valium and Xanax. Here are two sedative hypnotics that have a more recent history of abuse, GHB and Zolpidem, sold under the trade name Ambien. Down here are the opioids. These are the classic narcotic pain relievers, morphine, heroin, methadone. Here's hydrocodone, that's the main ingredient in Vicodin, an ancient one, opium, and an important newcomer used in the treatment of opioid addiction called buprenorphine. At the bottom of our periodic table of the intoxicants, we find the inhalants and the anabolic androgenic steroids. This is the dopamine hypothesis. What all addictive drugs have in common, whether they are uppers or downers, strong or weak, legal or illegal, is their ability to release dopamine in the pleasure areas of the brain. One immediate implication of the dopamine hypothesis is that if a person has a problem with one drug, they have a liability to develop a problem with any or all of the others. For instance, cocaine addicts often come to treatment quite willingly, but they make the mistake of refusing to stop drinking alcohol. Dopamine surges continue to insult the brain, and they find that they keep relapsing back to cocaine. Or the alcoholic, who tries to stop drinking by switching to marijuana. When things get stressful and their craving kicks in, it's likely that they will be led back to alcohol. Likewise, people who are newly sober from drugs like heroin or methamphetamine, who continue to chain smoke or drink huge amounts of caffeinated beverages, they are still creating very small but real spikes of dopamine. Their craving may get worse. But what makes the dopamine hypothesis especially powerful is that it shows us that not only chemicals release dopamine, behaviors can do so as well. And there are people who can manipulate these behaviors, things like food, gambling, sex, and codependency, to get the same kinds of dopamine surges as the people on the chemical side. This is called cross-addiction. If a person tries to quit their chemical addiction, but doesn't stop their behavioral addiction, they may have a very hard time staying sober from both. Once the brain has found something that is good for survival, it has to remember it. The brain uses a second neurochemical to do this, glutamate. Glutamate is the chemical of memory formation. It lays down memories of natural rewards like food. But drugs cause such huge surges of neurochemicals that glutamate locks the drug into memory. <laughs>